Okay, mineralization. And this is where the intelligent design of minerals and mineral fixation occurs. So in the process of creation, we have bacteria and fungi who are designated as decomposers. Their role in nature is to take different materials and break it down. And they do this in relation to their body mineral ratios. And so we'll walk through this process because this is incredibly brilliant. I mean, this is the coolest thing ever how God put all of this in place and how it works. So in a bacteria, on average, there are five carbons to one nitrogen. And fungi maintain a ratio of approximately 20 to one. Some fungi go way higher than that. But on average, let's just say they're 20 to one. Protozoa are like you and I. On average, we have a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 30 to one. Nematode are 100 to one. You go micro macro arthropods go up to 150 to one. Now, why are all these guys at such a different ratio? And the whole process here is absolutely brilliant because on the bottom of the level, we have decomposers, bacteria and fungi. In the center, we have predators. Now, protozoa and nematode do not eat plant matter. It's not their role in nature. What they're doing is they feed on bacteria and fungi. They're predators. This is the big fish, little fish story in the ocean, is big fish eat little fish, okay? And so everything that lives has to have a food source or it doesn't live. But it's also critical that that organism maintains its mineral ratio. So in bacteria, it's five carbons to one nitrogen. But it's not just one nitrogen. It's one phosphate. It's one potassium. It's one calcium. It's one sulfur. It's one magnesium. It's one boron and iron and manganese. Bacteria are the most mineral dense nutrient form of nutrition on this planet. They have the most minerals in relation to carbon that live. Fungi at 20 to one, they have more carbon in their mineral ratio, but all of the minerals are there, not just NPK, all of them. So the carbon, oxygen, hydrogen is as much of their structure and as it is a plant, the trace elements are absolutely critical. Protozoa are like you and I. You and I have a 30 to one carbon to nitrogen, carbon to phosphate, carbon to potassium, calcium, sulfur ratio. And we eat things that are in our ratio. Because if we try to alter our ratio of 30 to one, we die. So this is why we don't eat 40 or 50 or 100 to one material because we can't maintain our nutrient ratios and we die. Now, we can eat at our ratio and less and we're fine. We don't starve to death. So here's a story. I want you to picture two cows out in the field and then two farmers leaning on the fence. And the two farmers say, look at them dumb cows. They got grass up to their belly and they won't eat the tall grass. All they do is nibble on the short grass. And the two cows are in the field and they're talking to themselves and they said, look at those two guys, they're dummies sitting over on the fence. They can't figure out how come we won't eat this grass that's 40 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio when we're 30 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio and they think we ought to be eating it. We're gonna to starve to death on that and they haven't got a clue why we won't eat the tall grass. And so both of them think each other are dummies and the cows are the only ones that know what's going on. And so 
that's a perfect example of why organisms eat at their ratio. And so what happens in nature is protozoa eat bacteria, nematode eat fungi. And so we go through a great amount of CO2 generation in this process. These soil microorganisms regenerate our soil. They cycle nutrition. They control pathogens, decompose residue. They reduce compaction. They improve air and water filtration. They digest toxic chemicals. They adjust pH, they alter weed, pressures and more. So this is the magic because, because God is really, really good at microbial math. And so this is how it works. In a bacteria with its five to one mineral ratio, five carbons to all the other minerals, fungi at 20 to one, protozoa at 30 to one, nematode at 100 to one. As protozoa eat bacteria to get and maintain its 30 carbons, it has to eat six bacteria. In that process, it also inherits six nitrogen and also six phosphate and potassium and calcium and so on. The protozoa can't keep the extra nitrogen, phos, potassium, calcium, etc. And it has to excrete them to maintain its 30 to one ratio. So the nitrogen comes back out in the soil as NH4, ammonium. The phosphate is going to come back out with hydrogen molecules attached to it. Now, just as a side note, we buy hydrogen or phosphate fertilizer, P2O5 phosphoric acid. That is not a form that the plant can take up and use phosphate. And so if we apply phosphate in a MAP or DAP or phosphoric acid type form, soil microorganisms are going to have to fix it with hydrogen before the plant can use it. So this is an important thing to realize is is mineral fixation occurs primarily through the microbes. Why are we not focusing on it first and foremost? Because that's the proper form that microbes put into minerals for plants to use. Nematode at 100 to one eat fungi at 20 to one. To get their 100 carbons, they've got to eat five fungi can't maintain five nitrogen, five phosphates, five calciums and potassiums. So they excrete the excess out in the soil as a plant soluble form. Now, here's the brilliant connection between soil minerals that are insoluble, microbes and plants. You have plants that are processing sugars through photosynthesis. About 30 to 40% of those sugars will ultimately go out through the root into the soil as plant exudates. And bacteria and fungi love, need energy, love sugar. So they come into the root system to feed on the sugar-based carbohydrate exudates. Now, if you're a hungry protozoa, you go to the buffet line. So while the bacteria and fungi are feeding the protozoa and the nematode, if you have them, can also be feeding. And in that process, what you have is a complete profile of minerals that now become plant available all at one time. And so, Here's a really crucial kind of concept I wanna just talk about for a second. As a plant grows, it's not allowed to store up vast amounts of minerals 
in excess of other minerals in its profile. It doesn't do it. It has to wait for something else to become available because everything has to move forward in balance. And so if I have plenty of NPK available and I have no CO2, my plant can't say, well, goodness, I'll just change my ratios a whole bunch here till more CO2 comes along and then I'll catch up. What happens is it stops and it waits. So you go back to the image of the sunflowers. What was happening was we had a more constant flow of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur coming into the plant at a constant rate. But it was, be, it was because it was governed by biology. And so you have microorganisms solubilizing the complete pro profile of minerals in a form that the plant can immediately use. And so this predator prey relationship is absolutely critical to massive plant growth and yield. It's the driving force behind what that plant is able to accomplish in the same period of time. So if we did some microbial math a little bit further, if we just look at the bacteria being consumed by the protozoa, for every five nitrogen released, for every six bacteria consumed by protozoa, 10,000 units of biomass in protozoan. There are 50,000 bacteria per gram of healthy rhizosphere soil. 500 million bacteria eaten, 400 million molecules of nitrogen released per gram of soil. That's seven milligrams of nitrogen per day. Our plant per root unit requires 0.2 milligrams of nitrogen a day. So we have more than enough nitrogen produced through the predator prey profile of protozoa eating bacteria, nematode eating fungi. But also in addition to that, we have the phosphate, the potassium, the sulfur, calcium, boron, all the way down the line, the trace elements are also being released. So this process is more than adequate to sustain plants. In the seed treatment that we use, we are putting trace elements in on the seed. We're putting in FLC, which is a biological stimulant to grow microbes very, very quickly in the soil. Biorelease is a mineral chelator and a nutrient source for microbes. We want them to grow and we want to have soluble minerals for them to replace and grow rapidly with. Molybdenum is extremely important for nitrogen fixation through our biology. And in the powder side, we have 13 to 15 groups of soil microorganisms, some 40 to 50 species, depending on how we do it. The azotobacter fix nitrogen. We have six strains of mycorrhizal fungi, and they will fix every mineral in the soil except nitrogen. They all are amazing at phosphate, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium sequestration. They have very powerful enzymes. They can dissolve these minerals, pipe them right into the plant in exchange for sugar. Trichodermis, we have many groups of those that fight disease and help with plant nutrition. We have Bavaria bassiana in our seed treatment mix so that we have protection in the root and up in the plant against insects that attack. We have over 75 micronized trace elements that we want to dissolve and get into the seed for early and quick germination and to run enzymatic functions. And then we can add uh, different minerals for flow agents. So there was a book that encompasses 70 years of research. It was published by N.A. Krishilnikov of the Institute of Microbiology Academy of Science in the good old USSR. And the title of it is Soil Microorganisms and Higher Plants. 
And this is the most definitive work on microorganism and plant relationships. Now, this work started in 1880. That's 140 years ago. And it ended in the mid 19th century and was published in the early 1950s. So you have 70 year span here. And this book contains a tremendous amount of knowledge that we can verify today that it is just as true today as it was back then. But the sad part is this is what we discarded for synthetic fertilizer. And this is the shame that goes on industrial agriculture. They said the most important component of the soil atmosphere is carbon dioxide, the final decomposition product of organic matter. The intensity of this biochemical process taking place in the soil can be judged by the amount of carbon dioxide released. The formation of carbon dioxide depends to a large degree on the microbial metabolism. Everything that favors growth of microorganisms increases the generation of CO2. You can get a carbon dioxide meter and you can test the carbon dioxide levels in the soil and in the plant canopy. This is something that you can test. There are indicators that the plant roots not only release, but also actively absorb carbon dioxide. The amount of CO2 taken up from the soil may be of the same magnitude as that coming from the atmosphere or may even exceed it. The intensity of CO2 absorption from the soil depends on its concentration. The higher the concentration of CO2 in the soil, the quicker it finds its way into the plant via the roots. So soil microorganisms are just like you and I. We take in oxygen and we exhale carbon dioxide. Our soil microorganism beneficial species are aerobic microorganisms. And so the, mic the more microorganisms that we employ the more CO2 we generate. And so that is why we want soluble minerals for microorganism bodies, and we want soil microorganism stimulants to increase the output of CO2. Well, just dealing with those two factors right there drive 96% of the plant's structure above and below ground. These soil microorganisms are absolutely indispensable to everything that means yield and quality. Yet, through the last hundred years of industrial agriculture, we have done our best to kill them and destroy their environment with salt and acid-based fertilizers, which later required a great deal of fungicide, insecticide, herbicides, and pesticides to control the disease level that came from the lack of nutrition. Plant roots. Corn plant has over 300 miles of root system. When you colonize it with mycorrhizal fungi, you have 10 times the equivalent more roots. And the mycorrhizal fungi hyphae are minute compared to the root hairs. They're going to get into more places, more cracks and crevices to mine minerals and water than the plant roots will ever get. Roots are to anchor the plant, gather water and minerals, and they excrete all these wonderful carbohydrates and amino acids into the soil to stimulate microorganism growth and that companionship between symbiotic microbes that are directly tied to the plant and the mutualist microbes that live in the plant root system and cause mineralization. So when we look at the soil food web, here's a process where we have the very first level is we simply have plants, we have organic matter. In the second level, we have our decomposers 
those microorganisms that live with the plant. There are pathogens, there's parasite, there's root feeders. In the third level, now we introduce our shredders, our predators, and our grazers. And these guys don't eat plants, they eat the bacteria and the fungi and the pathogenic organisms. In the fourth level, higher predators eating microorganisms of the third level, the second level, and then on up the fifth level, everything eats something below it. And in the process, it's releasing nutrition. But these soil hierarchies, these different tropic levels, they have to be there to be functional. And I've done soil biology tests on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of soils all the way across the country. And what I can tell you is because of our farming practices, we have bacteria. Uh, we have very little fungi because there's so much residue that, ever, that never gets decomposed. Anything dead, a plant, residue, high carbon to nitrogen ratio, it's not bacterial food, it can't eat it. It's way outside of its carbon to nitrogen ratio. So it's fungal food. And without fungi, we don't decompose residue. It stays there. And we don't have the fungi, we don't have protozoa, and we certainly don't have nematode. Our salt and acid-based fertilizers, our chemicals have taken those levels of microorganisms right out. So in our soil profile, we have very few functional groups of biology. And so we don't have this nutrient cycling process happening. We don't have predators there to eat bacteria or fungi. They're not there in any meaningful quantity. So we're not generating that natural complete form of nutrition because we've destroyed that intelligence and ability of our soil and our soil microorganism communities to do that. 